Hey, don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, uh, share these videos if you're enjoying them. Much appreciated. Um, today I'm picking up um, uh, from Jack part two or part three or four, four. I forget which one, where we are with all this Jack. But I, you know, I really do, uh, I've said it before. I mean, it's not like you're the only person on here, but somebody who actually sees value uh, I'm doing it for you. I'm not doing this for, I'm not trying to be, uh, um, you know, to, to cause a rumpus, be contradictory, to be, to be a personality. I'm trying to actually get information out there so people can begin to see uh, how you think after you've been doing this for 50 years. And uh, sort of the, I say people think in different ways. Uh, and yet there's an awful lot of consensus if you want to put it that way and the, the more time you put in uh, struggling up and down the mountain or I should probably say up the mountain hopefully more up than down the more you have to say to the traveler and uh, I appreciate it if uh, I appreciate it when the two guys I had that I said with the first guy and the last guy were both way into their 70s I'm not quite that old yet but 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 there was something about the gravity of what they were saying they weren't saying like you know, things that had to do with their egos and that sort of thing. It was far more, you know, related to the love of uh, what they were doing and what they'd seen, what they'd experienced. And um, so I hope I can bring you, um, you know, whatever value. I, I mean, I hope the value I have comes across. And um, I appreciate it when somebody can actually, uh, when it registers already. So <laughs> I guess that's enough of that, Jack. Let's get on with this point, though. This is actually one of the sort of standard shop talk kinds of points. Um, if I haven't lost it here. Oops, I did lose it. All right, here we go. So the other question is, could you talk about the oil paint itself? Okay, that's right, you know, that's the, uh, that's the easel, that's the painting, that's the uh, palette. On whether you think oil paint is more conducive to painting thicker or more as washes, as with the addition of medium, or somewhere in between, depending on the stage of the picture. I think... Uh, I think what I'm going to offer you here primarily is the aphorisms that we were given. You know, uh, I think the greatest value of an education with Gamel, uh, I mean, apart from his experience, <laughs> obviously, was those aphorisms, those expressions, ex idiomatic expressions. Um, um, there, there are so many uh, different ways of saying that, the sayings, you know. But the shop talk is another one of those words. But Gamel had reduced a bunch of these things to, 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 to somewhere between a quip. I mean, I remember at one point, a quip, I was going to say between a quip and a, and a whole sentence, uh, a one-liner, sometimes two words, that sort of thing. But I remember one point he was critiquing my work and I think I wasn't getting it. I'll make that assumption. And he, and he stood in front of me and he said, I tried to make it very clear. I stood and shouted, it is here. You know, and that's a quote from uh, Through the Looking Glass or something like that. <laughs> and, and But it, it's the kind of stuff, though, that you catch that as something you're, he's going to say that's slightly memorable, that has some reason to be in your head already. And at the apropos moment, you know, it's amazing how it sticks. Oh, the idea that shadows are flat. You know, if you, if you are a Gamel student or if you're a descendant of the Gamel, you know that shadows are flat, as flat as a hat. Why, they're flatter than that, right? That's, that's axiomatic, right? That's, that's a, something, an idea, to, a thought turned into an expression. Make it as like as you can the first time, and then make it more like a quote from Bonat is uh, in that category. Ang has the one, uh, unless you have a concept of the thing fixed in your mind and eye, uh, you'll be pushing shapes around all day long. And the, so these are huge, 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 huge uh, things. They're bits, <laughs> they're bites uh, in the modern word of data that uh, have been so, so, so hugely significant to me. So the ones apropos of what uh, Jack is asking are, um, uh, having to do with the thickness of paint are pretty interesting. One of them, getting back to Angra, the, um, and, if you, and so I do read all the materials I've offered you, and I think, um, I'm not sure all I've given you, uh, Jack, but others, um, the, um, you might be able to find online the uh, Demar, Amari Duvall translation, the uh, translation of Amari Duvall by Gamel, uh, was a student of Ang talking about this stuff, but Amari Duvall talks about color with Ang, uh, Sorry, about the right amount of paint. Ang says, use the right amount of paint. And the students would be persistently saying, well, what's the right amount of paint? And he said that at one point they walked out the door of the uh, studios in, 
in Paris with their master, and there across the wall was a guy painting, as in painting a door, painting a wall, across, I'm sorry, across the street. And, um, and, and, and Ang said, now there, that's the right amount of paint. And uh, so there are interesting things like this. The right, amount, the right amount of paint. Now, it's not the thickness or thinness, but the right amount of paint is much related to that. So what is the right amount of paint? So you look at a guy painting a wall, and you say, well, this guy's going to use the right amount. So he, so he covers the wall, but he doesn't waste paint. Now, I mean, that's one way of saying it. We're not worried particularly about wasting point, paint in, in, in our field, but, but the concept's adequate. You know, it's a good concept. Uh, how much paint do you need? Well, make it enough paint so you can actually see the color you're putting down. Don't, don't, make, it a, don't make it so thin you can't see the color you're working with. I mean, you need a note. But if you make it nice and fat, and then you realize you've missed the note and you need to adjust it, you realize how thick it's going to get. It's going to become unmanageable, for example, at the edges. You're going to have a really hard time managing your edges once you get it that thick. So, so there's a rule of thumb then that follows that, you know, uh, it, and it's called thick over thin. You've heard of fat over lean, right? Well, thick over thin is that's how much paint you're putting down the first time. You're putting it down thinly, but not so thinly that, that it has no color quality. But just enough so that you could either it would work or you can add to it without turning it into something big and fat and unwieldy. So that's that amount of paint. But the one that Jack, I think, is really asking about is a Boston School one. And uh, perhaps all these are leading questions. Jack, I don't know you as a Boston School trained person. So, um, because they're very good ones for us, but one of them comes directly from Paxton, and it's the one I've found. I've experimented with all the things just like everybody else has. I used Marge in New York, and I used uh, straight paint with nothing in it with, in New York with some Terps, I guess, with Brackman and others. Uh, and I've used various mixes of the kind you hear Jerome used or Bouguereau used, and I don't find any of them do as good things as what Paxton suggests, and that is keep it as simple as possible. Use straight paint. And it really does look like, for the most part, that's what Ang is doing. And even though he talks about opaque paint. And that usually means to me solid paint and not looking for extra mediums uh, to make it more translucent. Um, the, um, but, there, but there are different ways of thinking about the word opaque in that context. Uh, because paints are frequently not particularly opaque in themselves. Uh, they're more or less transparent than others. Some are more trans, some are more transparent, some are less so. Alizarin is more transparent in its nature than, than, than Viridian by a bit. <coughs> and, uh, but um, that, those are other questions. But the medium, the idea of medium, I mean, there are people, I've seen such beautiful things done with medium, uh, with a, I'm talking about painterly visual and pleasure, painter, painterly pleasure, uh, surface pleasure, and that sort of thing, done by um, certain students, certain students of the um, of the glazing approaches that I would never fault it. Um, I just, you know, I persistently, I see that persistently they don't, they fail to actually get the note. They fail to hit the note. So if, if again, I suggest that a lot of people are painting within a range that they're satisfied with, given what else it delivers for them. Where the impressionist in the Boston School of the Boston School ilk is actually more sort of greedy for everything. They want the they want the wealth of the world. They want to be able to use it all as much as they want, as little as they want, um, and uh, frequently use really use a ton in a in a um, single painting of that wealth. So, um, yeah, that was that's that's but that, but the, but the bottom line for the Boston School guy if they're coming out of the, and I think Paxton really truly is the the most. <laughs> Not, not the most aesthetic model, uh, even though Gamble actually describes his work as that which sums up best what all good painting ought to do. I, I, I'm putting a quote in his mouth here, but if you read his essay on Paxton, and again, I think I can make that available to you if you're looking for it, if you haven't seen it. Um, but I think, he's, I think his, his uh, enthusiasm is flawed either from his loyalty to his teacher or which, a teacher of many, many years, by the way. It was his teacher. He hung around him for 15 years, drew with him, and took advice from him. He, in fact, said, I'd, I'd never had confidence in my drawing after Paxton died, which is a sad thing because that was 1941. And Gamble lived a long life after that, another 40 years. But I, I say that um, with all due respect. Um, so, uh, 
but but Paxton is a good model for the student in general, and 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 uh, that advice ought to be taken seriously. Uh, eliminate the complexities of the world that you wind up in, drying times and all sorts of things when you start using all kinds of other mediums, just to whatever extent you want to thin it. I mean, the one thing I have found is that when you're painting our way, if you want the paint to move nicely, make sure you thin your whites enough with the, with the medium that's already in the way, which is typically linseed oil. Thin it um, so that it moves well, but doesn't become watery. But so it moves well. And that white, because white gets into everything, will tend to unify the liquidity of the various paint uh, uh, colors you do use. And, uh, and I think you'll find uh, that your, the unity of that um, thickness will make, make it rather more predictable and therefore sort of eliminate one problem uh, that, that if you try and do two and three different things in a single picture, you'll, you'll be um, troubled by. So, I, but I think that's, I think I've covered most of what typically comes to mind um, yeah, the idea of washes and that sort of thing. Now, that's a question that has to do conceivably with a lay-in. And uh, I will definitely use a, a, what, you, what you may as well call a more a broadly, a more generalized note, but I typically put down enough paint, much like I talk about the wall with Ang. I put enough paint so the quality of the color is there no matter what. Where in a wash, the way you use it, if, if you're using the terps, for example, you will not have the color quality. You'll have, you'll have such a, an influence of the canvas that you won't be able to see the color in an adequate way. And the Boston School Impressionist is trying to hit the note right as soon as he can so that he can then, so that it has this influence, has this play with other notes, which you're trying to get on the table right away. You're trying to get these notes out there talking to each other. So they have to be authentically themselves as much as you can make them like and then keep doing it. So washes and that sort of thing implies a, a significantly different sort of uh, organizing approach to painting method, in other words. And uh, so, and as even Gamma would say, this, the method is the school. So yeah, so that's just another thought for another time, but there, there are definitely times to use those things, but not painting from life in a Boston school way. Uh, that's just not, I was going to say, if you want to look at that idea of the um, lay-in, what that means, the differences in the lay-in, I think you'll see a disparaging comment or two about the, um, the type of lay-in in the book by Hale on Vermeer, where he talks about that um, being like a rub-in. I think the word is a rub-in, where you try to cover the canvas with all sorts of washes and get it all covered up. And uh, to, to, a, to a boss's goal impression, all you do is you lose a good layer of paint. Uh, you lose a good layer of surface by doing unintelligent color marks that are just vaguely out there and not intended, not thought through, and not, not, and not uh, well seen as early as possible, and then adjusted. So, yeah, with that note, uh, thank you very much. Uh, like if you like, and um, comment if you want. Um, uh, share if you will. And um, uh, thank you very much. Subscribe, yeah, thank you very much.